again, and welcome back to the Six Five Summit. I'm Shelley Kramer, one of the founding partners of Futurum Research, and on behalf of my team here at Futurum and the team at More Insights and Strategy, welcome. We're glad to have you. I'm excited to announce our next Spotlight session, where Futurum's Daniel Newman is joined by Tom Anderson. Tom's the Vice President and General Manager, Ansible Business Unit at Red Hat, and our conversation today is centered on what organizations need to do in order to increase the adoption of enterprise-wide automation. This is sure to be a great conversation, so let's jump right in. Tom Anderson, welcome back to the 2022 6.5 Summit. I am so excited to have you once again here at our event. Thank you, Daniel. It's great to be here. I love that. I love the people that come back. It creates such a great opportunity to, you know, look in the, the rear view, uh, talk about what's happened. But then, of course, you know, we're in technology. So we're future people. So, you know, the past is a, a it's a bunch of indicators of things we need to think about as we build out towards the future. And it has been a year uh, since you and I have sat down for one of these conversations. Um, I'd say the world's in a slightly different place uh, where mobility is up. Um, you know, we're seeing return to work. There's still some certainly some hiccups. So we're, we're not completely out of the woods yet. But I think the topic of automation is really come into focus and that's where you spend the bulk of your time thinking, Tom. So I'm curious, you know, what are you observing right now in terms of, you know, companies' perspectives regarding the importance of making investments and deploying automation? Yes, I think when we talked when we talked a year ago, I think there was still a bit of a mindset of when things get back to normal. And I think that what we've learned is back to normal is who knows what, you know, between pandemics and global conflicts and supply chain interruptions and all of the other things that are going on in the world right now. I think this is a new normal, right? And so companies are adjusting to that environment and saying that the only way we're going to be able to deal with this level of unexpected change is by having a system and an organization that adopts automation. And so we've seen what I've seen is companies that we work with particularly the ones on the leading edge, we have more and more companies sort of moving along the uh, maturity spectrum or the maturity curve of automation. And uh, I, I've seen kind of three themes within those organizations. One is at the top, a real kind of leadership investment in automation, not just the CIO saying we need to automate everything, but really leaning into automation, identifying leaders in his or her organization that will be responsible for this measuring automation in the organization, measuring the outcomes, the outputs, making sure that they're having the business outcomes that they look for. That's one. Two, we've really seen a lot of different pressures on ops. The ops teams in organizations are starting to think like software developers, not be software developers, but think like software developers. And that means adopting some of the same disciplines that we've used in software development for years, whether that's source control, peer review, Automation is code. In, it's not just infrastructure as code. It's kind of ops as code. So we've really seen that mindset within the operations organization changing to be like software developers. And then last but not least, which is the pressures on the organization where um, the human capital, the human resources piece of it, organizations aren't able to find the people that they need and they need to reskill the people that they have. And so uplifting the skills within an organization and adopting some of the uh, disciplines or the, the, uh, the aspects of open source communities internally in their organizations with communities of practice to share best practices, to share automation across an organization. So I've seen those three themes, particularly in the organizations that are really pushing and succeeding at automation right now. Yeah, I'm really glad that you mentioned that macro environment. Even in the last couple of months, we're seeing a pretty significant pivot. We've got these sort of um, pressures mounting where you have this super low unemployment number and workforce challenges. So the tech industry has especially been, you know, at a, almost a standstill of trying to acquire the talent it needs to grow. But at the same time, we've sort of got this macro environment where you're like interest rates are high, inflation's high, you've got, you know, sort of policy being put into place that's sort of trying to slow growth. And so if you're a company, right, the kind of company that works with Red Hat and that deploys automation, you're sort of at this point where you're 
trying to decide how do we go forward, make the right investments, but make sure we protect our business in the event that there is a downturn. Because one thing we have definitely seen is that there was a rapid expansion that took place despite you know the challenges of COVID. And we haven't really seen a slow since this kind of automation boom has started to take place. And so, you know, you've got to find the skill, you got to find the talent. But part of my thesis has been that there's just this extremely deflationary narrative behind automation that companies that want to really protect their bottom lines, but at the same time, continue to deliver great customer experiences, keep their systems running effectively and efficiently, being able to manage new infrastructures and, and new modernized, uh, you know, architectures need to think about automation. So, you know, you're looking at automation for experience consistency. You're looking at automation to work across your environment, which by the way, has changed over the last few years. You know, we've seen a lot of more hybrid cloud, multi-cloud, that's where everything's going, right? Um, in your opinion, sort of how have customer environments changed in this past, you know, year or two um, in order to really enable uh, the next wave of automation? Yeah, so a couple things have happened. Um, customer environments have expanded in multiple directions. One is multi-cloud is a reality. We used to talk about hybrid cloud and then, you know, hybrid cloud being a combination, you know, depending on whose definition you're using, some combination of on-premise and off-premise commute, compute uh, infrastructure. And what we've really found now is that most of our customers have adopted multiple hyperscaler providers. They have multiple data centers. So multi-cloud is a reality. And then the second piece is innovation out to the edge, right? And the edge is playing a more and more important role in organizations as they look to innovate, connecting directly with their customers, enabling their field oper operations teams to be able to be more efficient. Um, so we've seen both of those dynamics happen at the same time. And what that has done is it stressed the internal, stretched the internal uh, operations teams to be able to adapt and be able to, look, if you have to automate infrastructure and applications on two or three different uh, hyperscaler providers, multiple data centers, multiple edge platforms. And if you're going to use bespoke tools for each of those things, you're not going to be able to keep up. So we've seen operations teams really looking for uh, systemic uh, uh, automation platforms that can automate across all of those environments. I mean, as you said, organizations just can't find additional ops people to come in. They can't expand ops at the same rate that they're expanding on innovation. And so the only way to kind of make them, make that, 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 that equation work is to make those operations teams more efficient. And automation has been the key to that. So that, that's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing those, that kind of both dimensions of, of multi-cloud and, and edge pulling at the, at the center. Yeah, I'm glad that you pointed that out. And I also think there's sort of an expectation of ubiquity, right? It's sort of where the workload is placed continues to be less important to the business experience, right? Now to the IT team, there's a ton of thought that goes into all that. And, and of course, you know, if you're an architect or a data center, you know, if you lead the data center org, you know, you don't want to necessarily hear that. But when it comes to how a customer engages how uh, an application needs to be able to access data, how a process gets automated to seamlessly enable a transaction or to seamlessly enable, you know, an IT environment to cure an issue. There is no, there, you know, there is, the concern is uptime. The concern is runtime. The business needs to function. And I think that's been one of the big transformations that's gone on. And so edge to cloud, while it's been a great architecture, for a long time now, mm -hmm. it's actually becoming, you know, um, imperative mm -hmm. to the business. And so one of the things I, I always love to ask Tom is when someone like yourself, you know, not only leads a team, but really engages closely with the most important customers in your organization, mm -hmm. you know, what does success look like? Um, and especially in these multiple environments that are prem, multi-cloud, edge, you know, how do companies sort of evolve their automation strategies, make sure that the edge is part of the thought process so that it it's the location really starts to matter less, like I suggested? Yeah, well, let me give let me give you an example, Daniel. So we just did a project at a, uh, a large energy provider here in the U.S., um, and they were rolling out a new application platform for their um uh, on their oil platforms, field platforms out in the field. So human machine interface application. 
Traditionally, that's been proprietary systems, very closed proprietary systems that just provided data to a, uh, to a backend system somewhere. In this case, this was a modern, modernized application, uh, application components running on that device at the edge, uh, communicating with data center components and sharing data with an application that was running on Azure. So it really was a modern kind of multi-tier application, but at the edge. And that's a different environment for the typical teams who manage those industrial edge environments, the, you know, the OT teams versus the IT teams. And what this organization was doing was bringing the IT disciplines that they've uh, worked on so much over the past few years in terms of automation and bringing that out to the edge environment. So while it was a relatively simple application, there were still eight to 10 different components that needed to work together to be brought together to make that application real. No IT people are standing out on a oil platform any, anywhere managing these, these environments. And so uh, our automation platform Ansible became sort of the glue that knitted all this environment together and allowed that organization not just to deploy it, but to update it and to keep it healthy uh, uh, throughout its life cycle. And so that's, I see that change where, you know, these different silos of technology teams within an organization, the cloud team, the storage team, the database team, the, the OT team that's managing these edge environments, these things are starting to be blended together, if you will, right? And so what is the what is one of the kind of common threads that you can that you can tease through that environment, which is automation. And if you can do common automation platform across all of those environments, you'll make each of these teams more efficient. Yeah. You know, these stories are always a really interesting way to sort of hear the tie together in a real world industry and application. Obviously, energy top of mind um, <laughs> right now. Yeah. Um, we need more of it. <laughs> we, we do not have enough. Um, anybody that's been to the pump, I mean, we're, you know, this event, these are pre recorded, but only a few weeks ahead of the event. And I think, you know, people are tired of paying $100 for their <laughs> Civic for gas. <laughs> so uh, in serious though, creating more uh, efficiency for these energy companies is valuable. I, I think there's a, it's a little bit of a tangential uh, topic because I'm not sure automation will get passed on, <laughs> even if it does make companies more efficient. I'm not sure we're going to benefit from that. But um, I do think that these companies being able to deploy this scale edge to cloud, multi-cloud is really important. Now, I do want to kind of ask a follow on to that though, is what is the measurement of this, I, I, I find it to be interesting, but I'm guessing your customers eventually kind of come back to you and say, okay, we're, we're starting to be able to realize ROI. Mm -hmm. We're investing up front, and as we deploy these, we're seeing better you know, results, whether those are ROIs or uptime ROIs, whether those mm -hmm. ROIs are bottom line. But I mean, I imagine these, ROI, these projects all have to come back with some sort of, hey, we invested this, Mm -hmm. And it's like building a factory. Now it's going to start driving returns to the organization. Yeah. So I've seen sort of kind of two areas uh, for ROI measurement, which is the speed with which things can be rolled out, kind of day zero provision. How long does it take you to roll out a new environment to one of these uh, or a new application and its dependent infrastructure out to one of these environments? That's the that's kind of been the historical measure of saying, you know, how efficient is our automation, which is how much can we automate day zero? But what I'm seeing now is a lot more sort of what are the benefits from day two automation, reducing the cost of ops. Uh, I think you mentioned it, reducing the downtime. Whether I think the, the 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 scales are tipping a little bit because we've gotten we've really kind of plumbed the day zero automation uh, area pretty hard, and now we're starting to shift over into day two ops. How can we make those environments more efficient? How can we support more of these environments with the same number of people? Um, how can we measure uptime? How can we measure security events? All of those types of things are starting to kind of weigh in now on the cost of operations for day two uh, in these environments. And so we're really focused, you know, future focused on those in, uh, on that as well. Yeah, I think that's a great pro thought process, Tom. And in, in Basically, what I think is going to happen as we see a lot of proof of concept go, go to scale is that, you know, this is going to become board level. This is going to become governance within an organization that automation must be a key part of your long term strategy. It's about the upskilling and up leveling your employees, giving them the next, you know, wave of investment in your organization and also talent, because 
nobody, you know, it's kind of like one of those things I think we've, we've used it as a talking point for a long time, Tom, like, oh, you know, we're going to upskill our workforce, we're going to re- remove the mundane, we're going to, but the, the truth is, is that if we want to continue to build, we want to grow the economy, we want to expand our organizations, you have to put your talent to the best possible use. So what I always like to end this kind of conversation is, you know, a little future forward, right? <laughs> um, what happens next? I feel like what I just said is sort of indicative of a large swath. Uh, companies are in varying levels from proof to small deployments. Uh, of course, there are certain processes that have been automated for a long time, mm-hmm. but this kind of whole organizational wide edge to multi-cloud mm-hmm. uh, automation across everything that can be automated at scale is still a little bit nascent for most organizations. Mm -hmm. So what's the next wave? Is that what it is? Is it it going to be deployed at scale? And then kind of how do you see the general economic and secular environment playing a role in speeding this up or or impacting how fast we move forward with it? Yeah, I, you know, just a quick comment on the economic environment. I'm no, I'm no economist, but you know, it, you know, you know, the clouds over the horizon look like things are going to become a little bit more conservative here over the next little while as, as opposed to kind of speed agility and, and, and speed and innovation, maybe that scale will kind of even out between cost and efficiency. And so we see a lot of that happening and where I see things going over the next little while, particularly in automation, which is where you really get to taking people completely out of the day-to-day operations of an environment. They become the exception as opposed to the rule. So automation becomes the rule, manual becomes the exception. We see that in event-driven architectures particularly, and so, you know, of course, I'm the automation person, so I think of it in terms of event-driven automation. So these event-driven processes and, and architectures where there is no human interaction at all, where you start really connecting AI and ML systems with automation to take actions on events and environment that happen uh, without any human intervention. So we really see, I see uh, an up-ramp over the next couple of years for event-driven automation, supporting event-driven architectures. That's one area. The second area, and this has always been important, but it's becoming more and more important all the time, which is security. You know, what is this, you know, we're, we're talking, at Red Hat, we're talking a lot about the secure uh, software supply chain. I'm talking about the secure automation supply chain where the, uh, again, if it's automation is code, do you know what that code is? Do you know the provenance of it? Is it, has it been uh, manipulated? Uh, is it either been manipulated by accident or maliciously? So are you, you know, what you're automating or how you're automating it, is that really how you want to be doing it? So are we being able to secure that automation supply chain from point to point? So I see both of those kind of vectors really moving out at the, in the future. And honestly, I think, Daniel, you know, the edge stuff is really just getting started. I know edge has been around forever. We've all, you know, it's a new, you know, it's a new way of talking about it, but innovation at the edge, open source at the edge, breaking down proprietary systems so that innovation can reach uh, associates in their, in their jobs at the edge and the industrial edge in, 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 in retail, et cetera, I- engaging directly with customers. I think there's a lot of innovation that's gonna be happening there. And without automation, that just isn't gonna happen. So I see at least those three things kind of happening uh, over the next few years. Yeah, absolutely. The edge has some very significant applications that you you mentioned that I think are worth pointing out again. I mean, the, the telco edge in 5G is going to be massive. The manufacturing and industrial environment. I mean, you t- like, you know, now you know we're sort of wrapping up here, so I don't want to go too far down this 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 rabbit hole. But when you talk about things like the metaverse and omniverse, like uh, the edge is actually this huge opportunity. Whether it's simulation and autonomous, you know, uh, vehicles and how we're going to be able to build smart cities of the future and being able to you know, create building environments for, for, I mean, we want to think about it through like NFTs and art and, and gaming, but the, the opportunity that this is going to have, but you need to have almost no latency. You need to have mm-hmm. really strong uptime. You need to have great levels of connectivity. You need developers that can build apps to, to take advantage of these environments. And you need a very robust edge that is as dependable as, you know, the hyperscale data center or our on-prem data center. So, this is a this is a big story, I would say, to be continued, Tom. But it is it is very exciting, and I do think to your point of how you started the answer to that question about the environment is, I think the sort of concern about slowdown is actually going to be a huge um, accelerator for the investment in automation because if companies want to keep going but want to uh, sort of hedge risk, you 
you invest in tech. That's what's always happened. It, you know, it was, whether it was, you know, 20 years ago and moving to the internet and creating web experience. I mean, it was, it was it. I mean, even just during the pandemic, the way we moved our businesses for supporting more e-commerce or remote uh, interactions and hiring, we are nimble. And when the, when the macro environment creates risk, tech is actually usually what we use to solve that risk. So Tom Anderson, Red Hat, love having you back at the Six Five Summit. I can't wait to have you back on the show, whether that's next year or sooner. Thanks so much for joining me here. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed it.